Hey friends, and welcome to Evident Grace Online. I'm so glad you're joining us for worship. My name is Gordon Duncan. I'm the pastor. And like many churches across the country, we are not gathering for worship today. And next week, we plan on having a full service going live. Uh, but this week, I have a recorded sermon for you. Uh, I'm blessed in some ways. I, I wasn't planning on preaching this Sunday. I had the Sunday off, and I had a wonderful guest preacher coming in. And so I wasn't planning on preaching uh, but I think in light of all that's going on, it's a real blessing that I have an opportunity to preach to you today. Our passage I'm going to mention to you in a minute is from Matthew 6, and it was picked out by our elder, Matt Murray. And listed below is an order of worship that you and your family can walk through together. And then when you get to the opportunity for the message, uh, then you can listen to this. And so I'm very thankful for this opportunity. It really is a privilege. Uh, I know it's an incredibly scary time. Uh, we've never been through anything like this, at least uh, I'm aware of as a country, and we're in the midst of what may very well be uh, uh, future lockdowns or restrictions. We really just don't know what's going on. Um, in the midst of the past few days, uh, my wife Amy and I have had a chance to talk about making plans and how are we going to have meals and medicines and school. And I think that's really the common conversation for most all of us. And she's reading a great book called Untangling Emotions by Winston Smith. And so as I was trying to put together this message, she handed me the book and she said, hey, read this quote. And so the first thing that Winston Smith does is he quotes Psalm 62.8. Now, the book of Psalms is amazing uh, because it is a picture of raw emotion of a believer before God. Many of the Psalms are written by David. There's a few others. Uh, but what we see quite often is the psalmist, the author of the Psalms, is incredibly honest. The psalmist will tell God, God, I'm really angry at you. The psalmist will say, God, where are you? I don't know where you are. And then the psalmist will also say, you've been amazing. You've taken care of me. Anything I've ever needed, you've provided for me. Almost every emotion that we've ever experienced, you can find in the book of Psalms. And in Psalm 62, 8, this is what the psalmist says. He says, trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. I love that. The psalmist is commanding you, he's commanding me, just as the psalmist was commanding his people. He said, listen, you got to trust God at all times. At all times. That's when uh, things are going wonderful and they're smooth and it's rainbows and, and, and clouds and money in the bank and everyone's healthy. And then you got to trust God like right now when there's a lot of sickness. We don't know if we're going to get sick. Uh, we don't know how bad this is going to be financially for our country. Uh, we got to trust him at all times. Why? But when we pour out our heart to him, we recognize that he is our refuge. A refuge in the book of Psalms is where a person would go to protect themselves from an enemy. Like it's a, it was a place, they had cities of refuge where people could go and their enemies could not come get them. And they're saying, listen, God is a refuge. He is our refuge. So in the midst of all this stuff right now with the coronavirus, with possible restrictions and lockdowns and quarantines and social distancing, all these things that we've never experienced, things that even a week ago at this time we couldn't imagine, God is our refuge. And we're commanded to pour our heart out at him. So in the midst of that, we're making plans, right? We're, we're like, okay, I'm going to get enough medicine for uh, three months, and I'm going to find toilet paper and eggs. And, and Winston Smith, the author, says this. He says, our hope is not in a system of strategies that we can enact, though we're grateful for a good action plan. Our hope is in a savior and a shepherd and the ever-present help in time of need who sees us a Savior who knows us, loves us, and actually has the power right here and right now to help us with the turmoil of our hearts. So that's it, friends. We've got to put together action plans. We've got to have action plans for church, our family, our business, school, our health, everything. But our hope is not in the action plan. Put together a good action plan. The hope is in a good Savior and Shepherd, Jesus Christ, who sees us and loves us and cares for us, an ever-present help in a time of trouble. Those verses have never been, those, excuse me, those, those truths have never been any more true and needed than today. Well, in light of that, what I want to share with you is from Matthew 6, 25 to 34. 
Matthew 6 is in the middle of what's called the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, this is when Jesus takes his public ministry. He, he has been doing small things along the way. But in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus goes up onto a mount and he begins to speak and he teaches. And it's reminiscent of what Moses did when he, in the book of Exodus, went up on the mount and received the Ten Commandments and the law. And he came down and he gave them to the people. And so Jesus goes up onto the mount and he preaches. And what he does is he gives his teaching. And he reveals to the people that uh, they haven't been looking at the law and God's commands the right way. There's been a, a shift and a tendency for people to just look good outwardly, excuse me, outwardly, but not address uh, the way they live and believe in their heart. And that's much of the teaching of the Sermon on the Mount. And so in, in chapter 5 of Matthew 5, we get all these teachings. We get the Beatitudes, uh, the blessed are the people who are meek, and the blessed are. And, and he teaches so much. And you can imagine that when he's teaching it, that there's this, at first it's like, wow, this is brand new teaching. But then there would have been a sense of dread and worry. Like, who, who's ever taught this way? And who can live this way? And so I want to read Matthew 6, 25 through 34, and then I want to talk about it. Because Jesus senses their reaction to his teaching. And remember, we want to keep that, pour your hearts out to God, uh, that he's our refuge. Let's keep that in mind as we read it. But this is what Jesus says in Matthew 6, 25 through 34. He says, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his lifespan? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field and how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. And when the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord stands forever. Jesus, in this passage, gives uh, an incredible command, but then he explains why it's possible to obey that command. You see, the commands of God are never just random. Uh, they're never just, oh, do this, do this for no reason. They're always attached to the character of God. So if God says, do something, if he says, love your neighbor, uh, then that's because the character of God is loving your neighbor. If he says, don't do something, if he says, don't steal, then that's because it's the character of God to not steal. Does that make sense? So when God says, do or don't do something, what we're always doing is we're reflecting his character. Now, when we are told, hey, uh, trust God or don't be anxious or whatever, the reason we're doing that is because it's the character of God to, to do something. So Jesus starts off and he says, therefore I tell you, and this is right after all this teaching in the law, he says, don't be anxious about your life. Now, anxious is uh, a, it's a dread. It, it's not eager. Eager is looking forward to something. Anxiousness is dreading it. So what, what we're being told here is do not, don't have a sense of dread about your life. Don't have a sense of dread about what you're going to eat or drink or about your body or what you'll put on. Like, don't do that. Now, right now, that may very well be the time where we think, now is the time to be anxious. Uh, you go to the grocery store, you can't find eggs. Uh, Amy and I were at a, an Aldi a little over a week ago. And this is when all this really started to have an impact. And we were there just to get, we went to get potatoes. We went to get some potatoes and a couple other things. And we were going to make uh, baking potatoes. You know what I mean? Like, uh, you know, like you, big potatoes, not little small ones. And there was a sense in the grocery store that was growing and growing. There was an anxiousness. And people were buying and buying. And this is a week ago. It's gotten worse since then. But there was a, an atmosphere of dread in the entire store. 
the people were beginning to think, oh no, there's not going to be enough here. And people were just throwing things in the car. And we couldn't even find baking potatoes like the big ones. We couldn't. And we're like, wait a minute, potatoes are, are cheap. You can buy a bag of potatoes at Aldi for like 99 cents. We, we can't even find potatoes here. And, and, and all of a sudden, we got that sense of anxiousness. And anxiousness breeds itself. It really does. And, and when you're anxious, the next thought is anxious. The next thought is anxious. And Jesus is saying, don't be anxious. Now, if any of you have ever tried to just stop being anxious, you know it's hard to do. It's hard to all of a sudden not worry. But there's got to be a reason not to be anxious. You can't just say, I'm going to stop being anxious. There's got to be something that makes you not worry. And this goes back to our understanding of who God is. Uh, if you haven't been with us, in the book of Romans, in chapters 19 and 11, God spent a lot of time talking about how he's sovereign. He's in control of all things, ordains all things. Nothing happens by accident. And so all the days of your life have already been written down in a book. God knows what's going to happen. And so right now, why should we not be anxious? Because, first of all, God is sovereign. None of this is happening outside of his control. None of it. But additionally, we know that Psalm 62a tells us that God is our refuge. That we can pour out our hearts and he's going to protect us. So knowing that, knowing that God is in control of all things and knowing that he is our refuge, then we don't have to be anxious. We're like, okay, God, my heart is so worried. I'm so full of dread. I'm so anxious right now. But I know you have all things in control. You actually have ordained this day to happen. It's not an accident. Father, be my refuge. That's how we begin to, to quit worrying as much. And, and, and then Jesus lists the things. Listen, don't be anxious about eating or drinking or what you're going to wear. Or don't. Uh, is life not more than food and more than clothing? It's like, listen, there are bigger things going on. You're like, Gordon, what can be bigger than eating or drinking? It's like, no, listen, listen to me. And, and, and he explains. Verse 26. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. He's like, look around. He's like, there are birds here, and they don't make money like we do. They don't have bank accounts like we do. We don't have uh, pantries full of food like we do. But God makes sure they're cared for. He makes sure they're cared for. And then going on, verse 27, And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to the span of your life? He's like, listen, if you worry, you don't gain anything by worry. Your worry is not productive. It doesn't add a day to your life. No one has ever worried and then produced something good. Your anxiousness and your worry does not produce anything. So he starts off, first of all, you got to trust God. God takes care of birds. He's going to take care of you. You start there. But then he goes to the practical, right? So the theological, trust God. He's going to take care of you. The practical, you don't gain anything by worry. You don't. None of you have ever gained a single day. And if God's our refuge, we don't have to worry. If God is sovereign, we don't have to worry. And we have to remind ourselves. We have to stop ourselves when we're worrying and worrying and worrying and we're anxious. we got to stop ourselves. we got to say, God is sovereign. God is my refuge. Father, help me not be anxious. I don't add anything to my life. You actually are decreasing the quality of your life. And I know this. It's hard. I don't mean to diminish anxiety or people who struggle with anxiety in a chronic level. I don't mean to diminish that. But Jesus is talking about the theological and the practical. The theological, listen, listen. God takes care of birds. He's going to take care of you. And you don't add anything to your life by being anxious. Verse 28, and why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, and neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like them. He's like, listen, look at the flowers and the lilies. He goes, they're more beautiful than anything that money can buy. Solomon was the richest king. And he's like, they are, they're, more, they're more beautiful and clothed, more beautiful than Solomon, the richest king, could ever be. And God provides for them He's going to provide for you. And when I read this, I mean, I'm, I don't think I'm necessarily worried about any of us running out of clothing in the midst of all this coronavirus stuff. But I think it's going to teach us, wait a minute, maybe there's too much of an emphasis on it. Uh, because most of us, if we're quarantined for a couple of weeks, I'm telling you what, most of us are not getting on putting suits on. I mean, we're going to be walking around in our pajama pants. Uh, you, we're probably going to have to tell ourselves, you know what, I need to get cleaned up a little bit today to feel normal. But I think we're going to realize here that we put too much emphasis on those things. We're worrying about our appearance too much. Am I beautiful enough? Am I attractive enough? 
We tell ourselves, I'm ugly, I'm not attractive. And he's like, no, no, listen, the, the, the flowers, they're more beautiful. They're more beautiful than anything that, that could be ever created or purchased by a king. And then verse 30, but if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much clothe you of little faith? He's like, listen, God put so much care into flowers. They're beautiful. And they're gone. They're here one day and they're gone the next. If God's going to put that much care into the beauty of flowers, then how much more so for you? Going on, why do we, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? He's like, listen, we're so caught up in these things. Verse 32, the Gentiles seek after those things. And your Heavenly Father knows that you need them all. Whenever uh, the book of um, Matthew references Gentiles, he's really saying that group of pe those people who don't believe in Jesus, they don't believe in God, that's what they worry about. But that shouldn't be the way it is for you. You have faith. And since you have faith in a good God, you don't have to worry as much. Verse 33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. The first question we have to ask in the midst of all this is what are we seeking? Are we seeking to glorify God? Are we seeking to trust our Savior Jesus? Are we seeking comfort from the Holy Spirit? Are we seeking how to glorify God? Are we seeking how we can love others in the name of Jesus? Are we seeking to be empowered by the Holy Spirit? Seek that first. God will provide all the things we need. Second, 34, therefore, don't be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Verse 25 said, don't be anxious. 34 said, therefore, don't be anxious. It's, a, it's an encapsulated uh, teaching of Jesus. He's like, listen, therefore, since you now know all these things, don't be anxious. Therefore, don't be anxious. He's like, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow's got enough worries because we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow with this coronavirus. We don't know what's going to happen with our jobs. We don't know what's going to happen uh, with any of these things. And, and if we can sit, what's going to happen tomorrow? We're worried. What's going to happen tomorrow? What's going to happen the next day? I understand it. But we need to not worry about tomorrow. We need to trust God today. Like I was mentioning earlier, put together a good action plan. Put together a good plan. Okay, what are we going to do as a family? How are we going to handle our finances? What are we going to do for eat, drink? What are we going to do for all those things? But today, we just need to trust God. We need to take our plan. We need to submit it to God. Like, God, does this plan seek first your glory? Is this plan going to seek you first? And that's my encouragement to all of us right now. Whether we're home or whether our jobs are deemed essential, whatever the case may be, as we do it, we need to ask ourselves, does our plan glorify God? Does our plan include mercy to the people who need it? Does our plan enable us to be loving and kind and gracious to our neighbor? Does our plan enable us, enable us to glorify God? Friends, I know a lot of you right now have children. Not everybody listening does, but a lot of you have children. And there's a lot of worry, especially with school. Uh, my, my daughter Meredith is a senior. I don't have any idea if she's going to get any of her senior year. I've got My daughter's like, I've got a whole other section to learn in this math before I take my test. I'm like, very practical. And if I don't take it, how am I going to do well next year? Those are the questions that are being asked. Little children who don't understand any of this. And what we've got to do is we have to preach to our own hearts and teach our kids. Like, friends, listen. Like, kids, listen. I know this is worry. I know this is scary. But God is a good God. It's a good time to teach the word sovereign. He's sovereign. He's not only in control. He's ordained these days for us. And so we cast our cares upon him. We pour our heart on him. But he is our refuge. We trust God. This is a wonderful opportunity to trust God. And when our kids are like, but what about this at school? What about this sport? What about this play? What about next year? Then we need to read the verses of Matthew to ourselves and to our kids and say, listen, tomorrow's got enough worry. We can't worry about tomorrow yet. What we got to do is we got to trust God today. Uh, friends, as you do this, if you need encouragement, uh, I encourage you, listen, uh, reach out to us at Evident Grace Fellowship. Uh, my email is gordon at evidentgrace.com, and I will help you in any way I can. If you have physical needs that can't be met, then reach out. Uh, message us on Facebook. Email me. and I will make sure that our deacons get that message. I love you very much. Evident Grace loves you, but more than anything, God loves you more than you can imagine. 
I hope this message is an encouragement to you, and I hope your family enjoys it while you listen to it. I hope you worship well. I can't wait to see you again face-to-face, and we'll talk soon. Bye, friends. Thanks so much.